welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Sam, and if you are already subscribed, this is just a very quick update that I am now officially foregoing monthly reading wrap-ups in favor of uh, periodic recaps, roundups, roundups of books that I have enjoyed and books that I have not enjoyed. Uh, this one is focusing on some of my favorite reads from the past few months as I really have liked just about everything that I've read to varying degrees. And with this, I have a collection of books from YA horror to Palestinian folklore. So let's get talking about books. Delicious Monsters is my first read from LaSalle Sanberry, and to say I was blown away would be an understatement. This is a horror story centered around a haunted house and those whose lives have become inexplicably, inexplicably, inexplicably entangled with it. <laughs> In the past, we follow Daisy, a black teenager who sees dead people. I see and spends most of her time holding her mother together. Daisy is desperate to escape Toronto where the dead lurk around just about every corner. So when her mother inherits a mansion in Ontario, Daisy decides that yes, they should definitely go and hopes that this might be a fresh start away from the dead and away from her ex-boyfriend. In the present, we meet Brittany, a young black woman who hosts a successful web series called Haunted. Brittany's boss sends her and her co-host out to this exact same mansion, but Brittany is already familiar with this, this place. Her mother credits an overnight stay at this mansion with making her a better mother, a successful author, and just frankly, who she is today. Sanbury's use of past and present timelines is done so well uh, and it ties Brittany and Daisy together so intimately despite all of these years separating their stays at the mansions. Mansion. These are both young women with less than ideal mothers and they really both just want to carve their own way and be their own people. Delicious Monsters is a haunted house story, yes. Uh, you are going to get dead things all around, gruesome imagery, uh, things that go bump in the night. You will get in all of your spooks, plenty of tension, and these wonderfully intense scenes that you read with bated breath. But the real horror of this story are the scars that our family leaves us with. This is a incredibly well-executed story of generational trauma blended with the classic haunted house trope that is, for, or at least was for me, an unputdownable read. Uh, I read this from start to finish in one day. Absolutely not a damn thing was going to pry me away from this book. It's painfully emotional at times in a way that just leaves your heart aching long after you've finished it and I simply cannot recommend this book enough. As someone who has read Carrie and enjoyed it, I think I gave it three stars, I have to say that the original does not hold a candle to this retelling. The Weight of Blood manages to be tragic in a way that Carrie just couldn't do, and I think a large part of that is the character of Maddie Washington, who I found myself wanting to hold in my arms so many times throughout this story. Maddie, or Maddie Washington, is already an outcast at her small Georgia high school. She's quiet, she's weird, and therefore it is no surprise that when her secret identity is revealed, she is an instant target for bullies. A surprise rainstorm leaves Maddie's normally carefully straightened hair a halo of kinky curls around her head, and she is then no longer able to hide the fact that she is biracial. And in a town that practices segregated proms, uh, this, again, makes her an immediate target for racist white kids in her class, of which there are plenty. Um, and from there, Maddie discovers a secret that even she didn't know she had. 
Something I appreciated about this book is how Maddie was developed and how the main characters were developed alongside her and how Maddie's issues were stacked one on top of another to create the resulting catastrophe. She has um, this religious upbringing. She has this identity that she has been forced to hide for so long by her overbearing father, this small town. These are all things that stack one on top of each other. And beyond that, I think in this book, the characters who exist alongside her begin to realize just how those issues have stacked up for her, which I think is part of how this book excels is that all of these characters are so fleshed out. It makes the story incredibly rich and human in a way that Carrie just didn't didn't manage to do. You feel as though you were reading about real people and you see how these microaggressions not only impact Maddie but the other black students in the school. We see how they are all trying in their own individual ways to survive. It's, you know, in this small town that considers themselves good despite uh, segregated proms and a racist past and present. And we see how this creates those white bullies who really well and truly believe as though they have done not a damn thing wrong. All because, you know, that's just how things have been. If you enjoyed Carrie, I think you should read this. And if you hated Carrie, I think you should read this. It was fantastic. And I feel as though Tiffany D. Jackson can simply do no wrong. Carmen Sanchez is back in her home country of Mexico to oversee the renovation of an ancient cathedral and she has brought her two daughters with her. But the locals are making her job incredibly fucking hard and her daughters are seeing a strange woman and everything comes to a head when an ancient artifact is unveiled at the job site. Carmen's youngest daughter has always been an excitable and willful child, but her change in Mexico has changed her. This normally cheery and happy child is now sullen and withdrawn. She is quick to lash out in very extreme ways. Uh, and it might have something to do with the voices that Carmen hears coming from her daughter's room at night. I don't want to talk too much about what happens in this book as I feel it is best to dive in with just uh, an element of surprise, but uh, Pinata is a book that will feel quite slow as the danger steadily builds up. The events that unravel are at times minor, at times not at all minor, uh, but the big things do take some time to get around to. Instead, we are made to feel just a little off balance as each scene unfolds. And uh, this book has almost a calm tone to it in the way that everything is presented to us. And I, I do I do think that some people might dislike this. I, I, I'm, I think it might be a bit too slow paced for some people, but I think that it went really well with the story. And I feel as though if the tone was changed, if the pacing was changed, it just wouldn't have been the same story. It really allows the imagery to sink its teeth into you. There is a subtle element to this book that is what hides the horror in a way, despite it being right there in your face. So those of you who are a fan of that atmospheric, quiet, creeping horror, this is one for you. It's, it's fantastic. It's occasionally gruesome and fantastical in all of the best ways. This is a short story collection inspired by Palestinian folklore with plenty of wonderfully short stories. Uh, I love a good short story, uh, but I want to specifically focus on my favorite within this book, which is Handala, the Olive, the Storm, and the Sea. This is one of the longer stories that's separated into two parts, the child and the man. Or is he a god? Or is he neither? This was my favorite for two reasons, because first it involved Greek gods, which as a little kid, I was like Greek mythology obsessed. I think I read through like 
the entire section in the library at one point and the parallels between these wrathful Greek gods and the apartheid state of Israel are just so well done. We watch as these gods make these decisions to bless this lonely immortal boy who travels for years to find his home. He doesn't age, he doesn't grow, uh, he, he can't do any of this until he goes home. And these gods grow vengeful when he isn't graciously accepting their useless gifts. They grow violent. They rage and rage when he dares strike back after being hit. They claim hurt. They say, look at what he did. Uh, it, it doesn't matter that they, he, they struck him first. It doesn't matter that they caused harm first. The fact that he did not prostrate himself at their feet uh, for these gifts that do nothing for him is in, is just the highest offense possible and so much worse than what they've done, obviously. And this was the story that I read with rapture. The, like, I was, oh, it was done so good. Like, you can really just see how that approach so directly, like, reflects par like the propaganda that we see in terms of what is given to the Palestinian people and how they are not grateful for things and how they're painted as these terrible people when they want to fight their own oppression. There are other equally wonderful stories within this book. There are these queer stories and this one in itself has queer elements, but um, I think that this is a really, really good read for anyone who has already started picking up Palestinian books and anyone who hasn't. White Tears, Brown Scars details the ways in which white women have upheld white supremacist structures both throughout history and modern times. It displays the ways that white feminism is realistically just another facet of white supremacy and that it does more than just ignore uh, black and brown communities, but actively participates in oppressing them. This was a book that was an incredibly timely read for me because uh, as I was assisting with the organization of the St. Martin's Press boycott, I was reading this book and I watched in real time as white tears were used over and over and over again as a means to reject and discredit the boycott, which I just want to reiterate is led primarily by BIPOC women. As I was reading about the ways in which white women used both consciously and subconsciously their role as the damsel in distress to turn any criticism of themselves back onto the black and brown women who dare speak of harm done to them, their own emotions and experiences, I saw it happening online. I cannot express enough how important I think this book is for white people to read. I know I have spoken about it before, but I really feel as though listening to black and brown communities when they talk about their experiences with how these roles and structures play, play out throughout history and in modern day, especially in modern day, because we get this idea in our head, right, that we're uh, post-racism or whatever. Well, not all of us, because we know better, but some people have it in their head that we are a post-racist society and uh, these things aren't happening, but they've just kind of morphed into something else. Uh, and they continue to be the same thing with just a different facade. This is a clear and concise book that I feel truly outlines how white women uphold racist structures and will continue to do so unless they actively work to deconstruct and stop playing into these roles that have been used throughout history as tools of oppression. Hood Feminism was a very solid read and I feel as though I could put Hood Feminism, Freedom is a Constant Struggle, and White Tears, uh, Brown Scars together as like a starter pack for uh, people who are getting into anti-racism because it's, it's all laid out very well, very clearly uh, in a way that I feel is uh, not pandering to the white person reading it, but easy to understand. I, I, re I did attempt at one point to read White Fragility and it was just so handholdy. And I, I mean, I guess some people need their hands held, 
Uh, but I did DNF that one because I don't need my hand held. Uh, so Hood Feminism is another book that, again, focuses on the failures of white feminism and the ways in which it just continuously does nothing to help these the, these communities. It, it does nothing but harm. It does nothing but oppress them. It ignores um, that the white experience is not the only experience, that the white perspective is not the only perspective, and that they really aren't doing much of anything because they are ignoring things like uh, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, lack of access to proper education uh, and resources, the ways in which things like beauty can mean completely different things for a white woman and a black woman, the ways that being you know, sassy as a white woman is again different than being sassy as a black woman and the perception that these things receive from the general public. It's really, really freaking solid. Uh, I liked it quite a bit. That is everything. I am currently working on my misogyny and horror series. I have things outlined and uh, partially scripted and I will be hopefully recording soon as I get through other projects. Mm -hmm.